Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Association Leadership Radio. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Association Leadership Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today, we have with us John Barker with Ohio Restaurant Association. Welcome, John. Hey, nice to be here, and, and uh, uh, nice to uh, you know be uh, one of these associations out here that uh, is keeping busy these days. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Ohio Restaurant Association. How are you serving the folks there in Ohio? Yeah, so the Ohio Restaurant Association uh, turned 100 this year. So it's been around a long time, one of the lo- oldest restaurant associations really um, in the United States. And, uh, it, you know, this was, um, you know, a place where a lot of business was birthed, obviously, you know, with the Ohio River going through uh, part of the state and big time commerce, a lot of restaurants. And people got organized back 100 years ago. And uh, we're still around today, probably doing a lot of the same things. Um, maybe we're cooking more inside right now than 100 years ago, but uh, um, doing a lot of the same things. You know, we, um, we're here to advocate on behalf of, uh, you know, the restaurant food service business and uh, promote the heck out of it in normal times. Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest benefits of associations and being part of an association is kind of that support you provide during challenges like this. Can you talk a little bit about how you've helped your uh, members through this COVID-19? Yeah. When you think about uh, COVID-19 and all the industries that have been affected, um, there are probably four or five that are at the apex of the problems in terms of being created by pandemics about this pandemic, as well as uh, just forced government uh, closures and restaurants would be in that top five. Other things would be hotels, uh, airlines, cruise ships, things like that. Um, but restaurants of most states have had a capacity limitation imposed upon them. And so what that's done is that's created <clears throat> tremendous financial pressure on restaurants particularly sit down in independent restaurants that really live off of people coming into a restaurant and um, sitting down and being served and the whole process that goes on uh, with that. And so, you know, what we did right away when this happened, if you dial all the way back, it's been six months uh, since this uh, really started. Um, we immediately went into what we refer to as a crisis management mode at this association and uh, reoriented everything we were doing to uh, try to uh, advocate on behalf of restaurants to get the best situation we could nationally and um, state in the state of Ohio here, as well as locally in terms of um, limitations that might be placed on businesses, particularly restaurants, food trucks, caterers, things like that. And we just, I mean, we've spent incredible amounts of time on that advocating for, for this industry. And uh, we've had some success. We really have. Um, And what I mean by that. In the state of Ohio, for example, we have uh, uh, a group that we put together uh, at the governor's request to uh, develop standards for what restaurants would have to operate under. And we created something called Dine Safe Ohio. <clears throat> and um, we did not have a specific capacity limitation put on us in Ohio. Um, what we had to do is uh, you know, prove to the governor and the health department that we would achieve six foot distancing and uh, separations with barriers as well as people wearing masks and cleaning and sanitizing. And then we created something called the Ohio Restaurant Promise for our restaurateurs, owners, and operators to sign to say, we're serious about this. And so we led that entire process. And uh, we think it's worked out very well, uh, considering the situation that you see in some other states that completely closed down indoor dining or may have had, for example, a 25% capacity limitation on, on restaurants. In those states, it's been awful uh, for the owner-operators. They're much closer to losing a huge portion of their restaurant base than uh, than Ohio would be otherwise, although, you know, we face some of the same pressures. And that's a great example of how leadership during this crisis can really um, make or break an individual business. Like you said, some of these business models aren't built on only 25% occupancy, you know. Like that, the math just doesn't work for uh, certain businesses when you limit them in that way. Yeah, in fact, um, I will argue looking at P&Ls in the restaurant industry for all my career, uh, uh, you know, being able to operate anything really under about 85 to 90 percent 
a restaurant is unlikely to make any money. And the proof to that is we ask our, uh, our operators here in Ohio every other week, we do a pretty comprehensive poll. Do you think you can break even in 2020, the full year? And 80% of the respondents say, no, we are not going to break even this year because losing that capacity on an already low margin business, restaurants are relatively low margin compared to other businesses. There's no way to recover. Uh, you just, you can't make up the cost. You still have all your taxes are due. Your rent is due. Your insurance is due. Payroll. I mean, every expense you can possibly imagine. The only thing that moves up and down a little bit is labor and then food. But many of them got saddled with, you know, a lot of inventory that uh, when they got shut down, they had to throw it out. So they lost all the money <laughs> back in March and April when they had to throw out a bunch of food or give it to food banks and things like that, which many of them did. And so they've has had a one hell of a year. Quite honestly, it's it's um, it'll be a year to remember, but it'll be a year to forget. Now, when the crisis uh, started, how did you kind of um, how did your team come together in order to kind of triage to the best of your ability, kind of get understand what's going on and how quickly were you able to um, move to, in order to help your folks? Yeah, it's interesting. We were sitting here in the office uh, on a Friday right before businesses started to get closed down. And um, we're sitting in a room and, and we started to have a conversation about working remotely. Now, this is before this all took off. And um, <clears throat> as we were getting more information about what was happening and talked to the governor on multiple occasions, we made the decision right there to have everybody go home and work from home the next week. And then, of course, that's been six months. Um, but we made that decision and we made sure everybody was equipped to work at home. So we made sure everybody had the right technology and connectivity and make sure they took files home, anything that they needed, because we didn't know when we were going to come back. So that was the very first decision we made on that Friday, fateful Friday. And I remember our CFO saying to me, well, this will probably be a week or two, and then we'll be back and we'll see how things are going. It <laughs> uh, uh, didn't turn out that way, um, but nobody knew. Uh, but we immediately moved into a crisis management mode, meaning that um, we focused all of our energy on communications and ways to make sure that our restaurant members and people across the state of Ohio had all the most critical information as quickly as we could get it to them. And so we established regular communications with the governor, with the state legislature, with national members of Congress, with local mayors. And we started to, you know, make sure that we were on top of all the information and we created a daily communication, formal communication, which we did for four months uh, without a break, uh, no days off. Um, and that was a godsend, I think, for our members because that communication link meant they always knew what was going to happen because things kept changing uh, over those months in terms of what their requirements were. It's like this in a lot of states and nationally. I mean, one day the CDC came out and said, you don't need to wear a mask. Two weeks later, they say the best thing you can do is wear a mask. And so we had to go through that whole process, just as an example, to put together procedures and get, you know, get the uh, information to the governor and have that conversation in Ohio, for example went from not requiring masks to requiring masks in all businesses. Just, I mean, it's been a nonstop up and down, back and forward in this process. Communications was critical. The second thing we did is we put together a content to try to help um, our members survive. And, and we use that word survive. And so it was a number of things like webcast and live virtual events and things like that, where we were bringing experts to them to help, for example, if you applied for the Paycheck Protection Program, how do you do it? You know, what are the steps? What are the processes? What is the information? What's changing? What if you wanted to get an economic injury development loan? How would you go about that? How would you go for a Main Street loan? How would you talk to your um, landlord to try to negotiate your rent down as a percent of sales as opposed to what it was before? How do you talk to your employees if you need to have furloughs and layoffs? I mean, it was just a nonstop for, you know, sort of a... Um, uh, formation of information to try to help. And then that's external. Then internal, uh, honestly, we use this phrase, how do we make sure that the ORA survives, the business model? And so we had to kind of circle the wagons because we knew one of the pressures we would have as a trade association is members saying we can't pay and we can't pay our dues. Um, and so we made a decision pretty early on to give a dues holiday for you know, really April, May, June, uh, and work with a number of members until we could figure out whether or not they were going to survive and how that was going to go. And so, uh, but we know we can't give away things for free forever, right? So, um, but we put together internal plans 
and we re- we reduced our internal cost by 35% and reset our budget with 35% lower cost. Now, when you were pivoting to kind of remote work, was that new for you guys to uh, work remotely and kind of uh, rally the troops, you know, via um, video conference? Yeah, it was it was new for some, not all of us. I mean, I, you know, uh, as CEO, because I have to work so much on nights and weekends and do a lot of interviews and things like that. I essentially have uh, an exact replica of my office set up at my home. Uh, and, um, and so for me, it really wasn't, uh, you know, a big, a big change to do that. What, what I think for some people is getting used to all the technology and zoom and WebEx and just all these new technologies, you know, teams we use and, uh, getting comfortable with their home technology. And, um, you know, then I think, uh, you know, after the initial kind of excitement of all that kind of wore off, then we had to deal with, you know, are people not seeing each other enough and communications between departments and, and individuals is, is it good enough? And of course it isn't right. When you go through that transition, you can't kind of swing around the corner and talk to your, you know, somebody that you used to talk to every day. And, you know, when you're near each other, right next to each other, you have a little bit of chit chat. You talk about what happened last night, where you went to dinner, what sports game you watch, whatever, right? Which helps build that cultural bond within your team. And overnight, that's gone, right? And so um, uh, those those were some challenges. And then, you know, what I've also noticed over the six months is I see fatigue setting in on a lot of people, right? Um, because the constant stress of working at home, not seeing anybody using technology, you know, having to, you know, complete projects by yourself sometimes, that's a new thing that people had to learn. And if this is, the restaurant business is not Silicon Valley, right? The restaurant business is high touch, roll up your sleeves, take care of your customers. And so we're used to being around other humans. That's one of the, the dynamics of the restaurant industry. And that has been, uh, has been changed significantly. Yeah, that's um, one of those things where you don't really appreciate it until it's gone. And then, you know, we're humans are social creatures and we have to be around other humans, uh, you know, to feel like the, you know, things are getting done and, and we're really connecting with folks. Are you finding that onboarding like new people or young people is a challenge um, in this environment where, like you said, there's less of that serendipitous kind of collisions in the hallway and then they can follow you around and shadow you that it's going to be harder to onboard new and especially young folks. Yeah, I think that's a challenge and you got to be up to it. I mean, we have two site, two forms of onboarding in an association. One is employees. The other is new members. And interestingly, <laughs> we thought, let me talk about members a minute. We thought our membership dues would crater. We thought, boy, we would, you know, be in, you know, in, in a place that uh, would be just off. So, we thought our revenues would be down somewhere around 30 to 40 percent uh, for the year, and interestingly, uh, we're kind of holding in there. We're to, we're track we're tracking at about 90 to maybe as high as 95 percent of our original budget dues for 2020, which is just amazing because we've been able to, you know, talk people through this tough period, and you know, their dues are, are are coming up. They've been able to pay, or we put them on, you know, maybe a uh, paid program. And believe it or not, we've had a, a lot of new members join because they see the value of a trade association more clear than ever. And so onboarding them is a little bit of a challenge because, you know, in some cases in the past, if a new member would join it, we could get out to physically see them. We would. We'd, we'd have a thing called the Ohio Works Here Tour. We'd go out and see them and talk about their business and things we can help them with and all that, which may be in addition to what we do online or, or you know, doing the telephone, things like that. And we're not doing quite as much of that, although we have started to get back out. You know, those of us who are willing to, to go out in in the uh, in the market and, and visit with folks. But onboarding new employees, it's funny you ask. We have two new employees starting uh, next week. And so our preparation for onboarding has been sort of like preparing for the Olympics as opposed to just normal way you might do it, right? And um, because almost all of it is going to be done uh, remotely. We, um, you know, uh, we even did all of our interviews remotely. Um, younger people seem to be less concerned about that than, than people of my generation. Uh, younger people like, so what? We're remote and, you know, we're being hired and we're going to be onboarded. Um, but it'll be different. And so we've had actually built a learning module program with a number of things that we used to just, we used to just talk to them about and work in over time. And now it's all going to be online for them to be able to, to um, kind of self onboard some of the materials and then follow up the conversations with our HR team, membership team, and myself. 
Now let's talk about the restaurant industry in general. Um, what do you think uh, the consumer should know about the industry as a whole that maybe they don't really appreciate? Well, first of all, it's a big industry. It's, um, you know, outside of the government and um, kind of the medical uh, industry, it's the third largest industry in the United States. And so it's, it's mega, you know, it's mega to the economy. It's mega, you know, to the U.S. economy, to the states like Ohio. In Ohio, just give you an example, we have 585,000 people who work in the restaurant industry. And it's not just people who are at the drive through that, you know, kind of wave you through in the morning to get your coffee. Although that is a fair amount, you know, uh, of people because quick serve restaurants are big. But, you know, we have people who have made it their life's work. I mean, they are owners and they're operators and they're general managers and their shift supervisors, their chefs, their sous chefs, their, you know, people who've decided this is where they want to spend their career and they love it. Um, and that's about 10% of the workforce um, in, in Ohio. Another 10% are all the businesses that support restaurants, whether it be food distribution, farmers, marketing people, legal, um, everything you can possibly imagine that is around a big business that's very, a very physical business, right? It's re- it requires a footprint a big capital investment, lots of equipment, things like that. And so it's a big and important industry for, uh, for our um, nation. And so that's why we have talked so much with our elected officials about why it's critical to keep this industry vibrant. Because if you would lose even half of this industry, the ripple effect through the economy will be, you know, something we just haven't seen before. In fact, you know, the unemployment rate for the, our industry right now is pushing 20% right now versus the national unemployment rate. I think the last I saw was around nine, the national unemployment for all industries. Yeah. Now, um, are you seeing any kind of silver linings or, or some trends that might, as you get into 20, as you look towards 2021, that maybe come out of that other than I think uh, now every restaurant's going to have some version of curbside or delivery or um, drive-through in the future. Yeah, I think that's one of the big trends. It was coming anyways. You know, we're seeing more and more of that. That doesn't replace, you know, the great sit-down restaurants that you go to and you get that fabulous hospitality. It doesn't replace that because humans still like to do that, particularly Americans, still like to go out and sit down and be with their friends or their family or whatever the case might be, coworkers and sit back and have somebody really t- kind of take care of them. It's, it's a, it's kind of an American tradition and it's across all sectors of our population. It's not, you know, it's not just one. And so, you know, that piece has been the one that's hurt the most during the pandemic because, you, you know, you have a hard time doing that, but this trend towards, you know, carry out and contactless and using apps to make your order and third party delivery and delivery. Yeah. That that's been coming and that's been accelerated. Um, and so when you think about sectors of the restaurant industry, pizza sector has done really well compared to everybody else. In fact, many of our members that are in the pizza sector, their sales are actually up versus a year ago. Um, some quick serve restaurants, which were down for a while, they've turned slightly positive. And, um, and the big reason there is they have very efficient you know, pickup windows, so they, they can do well. But most other... Um, brands, most other sectors are really struggling. I even saw news out just yesterday, Starbucks, same store sales continue to to be negative versus a year ago. And that was a juggernaut, right? But why is that? That's because so many Starbucks are in downtowns, in cities. And if you go to most cities today, there's hardly anybody downtown. All the office buildings are sort of empty or or hardly ever, you know, uh, full. And, uh, you know, legal offices or if there's a government, all that is way off. And so a lot of those Starbucks and other restaurants downtown, they're already closed. You know, a lot of those have gone from, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen. They're temporarily closed. And depending on what happens longer term, they may not reopen and have to focus more on, you know, those off the highway uh, exits and suburbs and things like that. So that's going to be another change we got to watch real carefully. I, for one, am concerned about the downtowns. I think, you know, you've had a harder hit for downtown businesses than rural or even suburban businesses for lots of reasons. And it's going to be longer to come back because, you know, you get, unfortunately, kind of a a cycle of businesses started to move out, restaurants move out, coffee shops, ice cream shops, retailers, and fewer people might want to live there because that's one of the reasons you want to be downtown. You want to be near all that. You want to be near the arts. You want to be near sports, professional sports, things like that. So, you know, that's a trend that uh, we're going to watch very carefully. And, and I am concerned about that. 
Yeah. Now, um, is there anything you're looking forward to uh, for the Ohio Restaurant Association into 2021? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, if we can get through the worst of the pandemic, and um, we don't know when that's going to be, right, but it has to be something that includes um, you know, some sort of uh, vaccine that people feel comfortable in, in by the hundreds of thousands, you know, we're, we're all taking it and or meds, you know, some sort of uh, meds that you might take like you do for other, you know, other things like the regular flu and things like that that can, that combat it for most people. Um, getting past that then will move us into the next phase, whatever that's going to be, but removing capacity limitations, removing curfews, things like that. And restaurants, you know, um, those that survive. And, and by the way, we are going to lose restaurants. And the, the number and percent, we just don't know for sure. I've seen estimates, you know, as low as 5% up to, you know, as much as half of all restaurants can close permanently, depending on the source and, and what you want to believe or how you want to look forward. Um, so the restaurants that do survive, I think there'll be tremendous market share for them uh, to pick up. And then there'll be opportunities for other people to step in and fill the demand that will you know, probably be there on the other side of the pandemic. And so we are looking forward to that. But in the meantime, you know, a lot of our, just our favorite, you just think of any community you live in and that little mom and pop restaurant, that independent operator that does such a great job taking care of you when you walk into that restaurant and they have 20, 30, 50 people who, you know, their, their existence is dependent on that restaurant, right? They make a living there. Those are going to go away. Um, some percent of those are going to go away and that's going to change our neighborhoods. It's going to be sad to watch that. So it's one of the things we're fighting like hell for is a second round of uh, a re relief bill, which would include a uh, paycheck protection program. And uh, many of our restaurants were able to take advantage of that and help them get through the summer months. That money is mostly gone right now for most people. So we're advocating uh, with Congress that small business needs that support again, more than any other industry, because We've been forced to close by the government. It's a government mandate that's forced to close or to severely uh, limit your capacity. And so we're asking for that support. We're working right now with members of Congress, including uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Mark Meadows, uh, and others uh, in D.C., Steve Mnuchin. And so, you know, we're pointing that out and saying if you don't step in and give some help, you're going to change. You're going to change the U.S. economy significantly, and you're going to change downtowns, and you're going to change neighborhoods. Right. The time to act is now. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing your story and, and congratulations for um, serving your members in the way that you do. We really appreciate your leadership. Well, thank you very much. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of perseverance, right? Um, these, these sorts of, uh, these times really test you, but you think about our forefathers and the things that they went through in terms of depression, right? And, uh, and, and world wars and just, you know, when you go back and think of 9-11 and all these things that our, our country has been through. And we got through it because we had, you know, great leadership and people that wouldn't you know, kind of give up. And, um, and I think, you know, between our industry, our restaurant industry, which is made up of a bunch of tough people and our trade association and our board and everybody that's kind of rolling up their sleeves, we're going to go swinging, right? And we're going to swing hard and, and do the best we can. And so it's, um, uh, you know, it's kind of responsibility that you're given when you, when you give the, the when you're given the leadership mantle and you step up and uh, do the best you can. Well, if somebody wanted to connect with you um, uh, or have a more substantive conversation, is there a website for the association you can share? Yeah, OhioRestaurant.org, and um, our website, you know, is, is pretty fulsome. It has all our contact information on there, and any of any of us would be happy to talk uh, about uh, our association and what we're doing to try to be. Uh, you know, we have a mantra here at the ORA, and that is we're on a never-ending journey from good to great. And, um, you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to be at least good right now and at times be great. Well, John, thank you again for sharing your story. Thank you. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Association Leadership Radio. Mm -hmm.